the seating now would be uh, with regard to uh, D and G board review uh, to address whether and how to amend the process for board review of the decision and direction of election. Uh, seated would be Brian Petruska and uh, Kurt Kirshner. Okay, um, <clears throat> Mr. Petruska, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Pierce, uh, members Hirozawa, Johnson, Mascara, and Schiffer. Uh, my name is Brian Petruska. I am counsel to the Layuna Mid-Atlantic Regional Organizing Coalition. We are a coalition of laborers district councils located in six states stretching from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. The coalition is the organizing arm for the Laborers International Union in those states. My office is in Reston, Virginia, and I primarily practice before Region 5. I would first like to address um, why the proposed amendments are necessary. I was uh, surprised to see quite a number of comments from business organizations questioning the needs for these amendments. Um, and I was surprised because, in my opinion, the board's representation election program faces nothing short of a crisis. In 2009, the board conducted approximately 1,700 representation elections. That number represented the fewest since 1940, but that comparison isn't fair because the elections in 1940 involved nearly 600,000 workers, whereas only 96,000 workers were involved in 2009. I hardly need to point out that the U.S. workforce is now three times larger than it was in 1940. Moreover, the board floats adrift of its core mission. Approximately 90% of the board's caseload consists of ULP filings, with only 10% directed to elections. This is a profound inversion of the board's purpose. The National Labor Relations Act is wholly different from Title VII and the other civil rights employment statutes. It does not create a private right of action for the purpose of providing individual uh, recovery. Rather, its purpose is, in the words of the act, to encourage the practice and procedure of collective bargaining. The way the board encourages collective bargaining is centrally by holding these representation elections, and the board is currently failing in that mission. It is only reasonable for this agency to question why, with so many workers now compared to then, so few take part in representation elections. It is only reasonable for this agency to ask, what can it do to make the process more accessible? The proposed rulemaking is a modest step in the direction of making the election process swifter, less litigious, and more fair. In light of the historic decrease in the utilization of its representation apparatus, not taking these steps would be an abdication of the agency's responsibilities. Which brings me to the proposed rulemaking. What is at the heart of this rulemaking? There are many parts, but central to it is the elimination of an interlocutory review. In the annals of jurisprudence, few things are more settled than the conclusion that an interlocutory review is wasteful. It causes delay and produces piecemeal litigation. Interlocutory reviews are generally considered anachronistic, and their elimination usually is considered reform. The specific facts here support the board's current proposal to eliminate the review of the direction of election, uh, the interlocutory review. From 1973 to 2009, requests for review were filed in only 1.2 percent of cases. This is RC cases, on average, um, resulting in the modification or reversal of case outcomes in only seven tenths of a percent of RC cases. Yet this level of review has a median period of delay, averaged over 29 years of 257 days. It's over eight months. As an aside, I currently have an election uh, which ballots have been impounded since last July. Um, it does not make it, it due to a request for review. It does not make sense to prolong cases by a factor of 600 percent in order to adjust the outcome of seven-tenths of a percent of cases. Particularly in light of the board's serious backlog, the agency can and should take reasonable steps to reduce redundant <laughs> litigation. A final point. My written comments point out that the utilization of the request for review process historically correlates strongly with the incidence of illegal discharge and illegal uh, intimidation unfair labor practices. From 1990 to 2009, the correlation is very high, nearly one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. I do not suggest this correlation provides a basis uh, for eliminating this review, but it does. It is a factor um, that should support the decision to eliminate what is otherwise some redundant and uh, potentially wasteful procedure. At bottom, those who oppose the elimination of the interlocutory request review do so on the grounds 
uh, of inertia, that an object at rest should stay at rest. They are left with this argument because the process has little to recommend itself on its own merits. If it had never existed, no one would see fit to establish it. If it were eliminated, no subsequent board is likely to see fit to restore it. The proposed rulemaking has it right on the merits with request this, this step. Uh, the current request for uh, review, the interlocutory request for review should be eliminated as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Petruska, thanks for being with us today. You know, <coughs> one way to eliminate <coughs> the need for board review would be to go back to the pre-1960, <coughs> uh, early 60s delegation of representation cases to regional directors, because we decided all of those, then there wouldn't be any need for review. But uh, you know, as opposed to inertia, you know, I said before, you know, we want to get to the right outcome promptly um, and uh, do it in a way that's consistent with the statute. You know, the statute says that the parties have the right to seek board review of, quote, any action of regional directors, including requests that we review pre-election uh, party motions to for stay in the election. So what do we do with that to the extent that as the proposed rule uh, you know, indicates that it purports to accomplish the elimination of that review prior to the election? Sure. I mean, the, the review or the um, proposed rulemaking does state that it will permit a review upon request discretionary in circumstances. I believe it would look for a standard where the review might otherwise escape review. Yeah, um, that's the review federal review. standard for interlocutory reviews in general. Um, I believe that uh, there's a separate exception in the federal cases. But um, generally, a standard is to get to an appeals court in the middle of a case, you have to be able to show that uh, the case might otherwise evade final review. Um, I don't see anything in this proposed rulemaking that differs from that. Um, I do think that all the, that the parties uh, can have the rights preserved to, to raise any issue they need to raise without, I mean, it doesn't have to be done before the end of the case. It doesn't have to be do, done in the middle of the case. I do think it would be important to make sure that the process does not eliminate um, the, the ability to raise an issue, but consolidating it to the end of the process, which is how I understand the proposed rulemaking, I think given all the factors is, is the proper course in terms of, uh, you know, prudent husbanding of, of resources, dealing with I mean, this, this, this board has had a lot of issues with the two-person the two person board, um, lots of things that have made, that, that have made its, its docket, I imagine, uh, quite long. Um, and, uh, and consolidating litigation is a prudent step to, to help redress that problem. Thank you. Why should there be a presumption that an election was regularly conducted if we basically move virtually all review of it to the back end after it's taken place? whether election would always occur is that no no why should we have a presumption that an election was regularly conducted and the results should stand as is if we're basically moving all of our review to it at the back to the back end um well so i i'm not sure that that that's i'm not sure that it's the presumption and i'm not sure that having the interlocutory review rejects that presumption um yeah uh the there is still the discretionary review at the at the end of the proposed rulemaking. Um, if if in fact the uh, election has been improvidently held, the board can address it at that time. It will receive the papers. It will be able to make a full determination based upon the filings. Um, and I don't think that reflects a presumption. What proposals, if any, would you have though to make sure that um, there was no delay on the back end of the process? Uh, can you specify where in well, the process? Well, basically, I, the way that I take it is you're not thrilled about having to wait mm -hmm. a very long time while a request for review is pending. So we basically pull that piece, put it to the end of the process, wherever it may end up. You know, who knows what the final rule may end, ultimately end up looking like. Uh, should there be anything where we self-regulate in terms of timetables in this regulation to get out decisions on elections, election requests for review? You're saying under the current procedure or under the proposed rule? The proposed rule, a modification. Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. sure. Well, 
it seems to me mm -hmm. that one of the main problems you have is delay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It also seems to me that part of the problem for the delay is essentially the board is sitting on this. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, should, as part of this NPRM, we attempt some self-regulation in terms of turning around decisions mm -hmm. on these issues, regardless of where, where they end up in the process? Like a, a mandatory dismissal after it sits for a certain period of time. Right. or perhaps going the other way, it's like a mandatory grant of review if it's sat for a certain period of time. Um, that process wouldn't make sense to me. I, I don't see much to recommend that. Um, because? Uh, an automatic an automatic either grant or deny of it? Well, well if, if I it mean, automatically grants to review, then you're just going to have a larger backlog. So right, it makes but the problem worse. The, well, that probably isn't the only reform that would be necessary to speed things up. But, I mean, do you have a concern that we would be slow on the back end of all this process if essentially our review is at the back end of after the election already happened, or is that not concerning to you? Well, um, I suppose it's possible. I, I think, in general, um, one of the merits of the proposed rulemaking is that by having the election process play out, you do let the election itself play a role in narrowing and eliminating, potentially eliminating uh, litigation. One thing I point out in my comments is that currently around 95% of cases don't involve um, determinative challenges. Um, presuming that you have a, 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 st a ratio like that, letting the election determine eligibility issues is, very, is a smart thing to do because you're going to eliminate most of them. Um, similarly here, once you have the election outcome, um, the parties will, will know what the initial determination of the election was, and it may be that people who had a gripe uh, somewhere in the process like the election result. And so that's going to eliminate that litigation because they won the election, even though they didn't like the process. Um, so I, I think by consolidating and narrowing, you probably do reduce the overall amount of litigation rather than uh, enlarge it. No, I think that's a plausible thesis, but it, would that be the only source of your um, way that we institutionally solve the delay problem is just by issues dropping out because we go through and hold an election. Um, you know, I know that the board can delegate to three-person panels to, um, you know, divvy up uh, the, the caseload. Um, you know, you have a five-member board now, uh, first time in a long time, so that would, that was obviously a smart way to do it. Um, I, I don't see much of an alternative to going through and dealing with the cases you have, but I do think a proposed rulemaking is a smart step in terms of letting the election process do do a lot of the heavy lifting of reducing litigation and also keeping that litigation from being dealt with repeatedly in the process. Okay. In the example you gave, the board granted review? No, it's still pending. The request for review is still pending. And could you comment on the delay in cases where employers, if there is any, the, the uh, impact of the proposed rule change in cases where employers do not request review? Um, comment on the effect of it? Right. I mean, the proposed rule would eliminate the 25-day waiting period, right. right? So can That's you right. comment on that, too? You didn't specifically comment on that. Well, when looking at all the different steps, I mean, the, the proposed rulemaking, as I look at it, clears out obstacles to conducting elections expeditiously. And the biggest, the biggest um, uh, time period it, it uh, sweeps away is the 25, minimum 25 day in scheduling the election. I mean, it's foreseeable that if you have a stipulated election, you could do that one, two weeks later. Now, of course, with a stipulated election, it's going to be agreed to. The date gets agreed to. Um, but there would be no presumption, no reason for if the, there's no other reason not to hold it in a week. The employer has no other reason not to hold it in a week. You would hold it a week after stipulation, or you could hold it two weeks after stipulation. Um, and uh, so that does a great deal to expedite the election process by eliminating the, the formality of the 25-day waiting period. Thank you very much. Thank you.